Dr. Sulkan Ahmed is my yeah. welcome to yes. Neo Science Hub. Thank you so Thank much. You. We appreciate you joining us. Thank and you. I was going through your background, your profile, very impressive. And I was uh, almost popular exact to start from. So <laughs> actually, the next issue of our Neo Science Hub is going to be on fertilizers. Fertilizers. So because yeah. Yes, because it's on fertilizers, my first question is, just to be in sync with the fertilizer, I just want to ask you, what is the current soil status in India? And is our soil fertiling up or is it urbanization or is it pollution which is degrading our soil? That's a good question you have asked. You know, like, in fact, you said uh, fertilizing. Uh, that itself, we have started making a mistake in our own soil systems. Basically, what has happened is, uh, as I can talk to people who are common and who know about uh, what we eat and what we live for, uh, you take any soil sample and give it to any accredited laboratory and ask them to test the soil for its quality. And they would definitely analyze for NPK, that is nitrogen, phosphate, and potash, along with pH and electroconductivity. And uh, they may add up a few micronutrients and they don't stop with that. They then put recommendations and they suggest how much of urea and how much of DAP and how much of uh, potash has to be added. So what has happened in the course of time is soil fertility got related with fertilizers. The more fertilizer you add, the soil will be fertile. A sort of a wrong concept started developing. There's a reason why in we who work on organic inputs and uh, talk about organic inputs, we don't refer as soil fertility, we refer as soil health. Soil health becomes a holistic component. That is where the smell, you know, like soil smell, which we talk about, mitiki khushbu, the soil smell. Now, this fragrance of the soil is not because of soil per se. You take the soil, you dry the soil, you smell the soil, there's no, no smell in the soil. And people feel when it rains, you get that fragrance. But water is odorless, water has no smell. So soil has no smell, water has no smell, but soil has soil smell, which is characteristic and that's pretty sure. This petrichor smell is because of the microorganisms which live in the soil. So basically, we know that the more salts you add into the soil, the more salts, like for example, the salts of uh, nitrogen or nitrates, the salts of uh, phosphorus or phosphates, the salts of potash or potash, the more salts you start adding into the soil, the soil organisms start depleting in numbers, especially the microorganisms, as in the macro like the earthworms, which are very sensitive to soil salinity. So when these things vanish, the soil fragrance starts diminishing. There's a reason why olden days people said, the more the fragrance, jitni miti ki khushbo hogi, the more the fragrance, the more fertile or the healthier the soil is. So the organic matter content, the basic smell of the soil, this has started depleting. Generally, the organic matter content for Indian conditions should be somewhere between 2% to 5%. Unfortunately, the national average today is around 0.4%. Oh. I am from Tamil Nadu and in Tamil Nadu, according to official data, it is 0.68%. But my research is, uh, it varies. Uh, some places down south, we get 0.2%, which means it's, uh, it's in a very pathetic condition. I would rather say that the soil in many regions of my country is in the ICU and requires immediate attention. Because soil health is crop health, crop health is human health, and all biodiversity health. That's how it goes. Oh, that, that's a very alarming situation, what you're told. So, what, what are the plans going ahead? Like, Tamil Nadu is supposed to be a very agrarian society. And do we have yeah, any plan I'm, for. I'm lucky to be in Tamil Nadu. Uh, the thing is, uh, basically what has happened is, uh, I always use some quotes because, you know, like uh, uh, a pregnant mother, uh, if the baby has to be healthy, we don't inject medicines to the baby. We take care of the mother. That's the reason why, you know, like uh, women can give healthy baby, uh, give birth to healthy babies. Similarly, in, so in agriculture, instead of taking care of the mother, which is the soil, Topographical uh, treatments like uh, handling the crop and giving excess fertilizers has been taken care of for so many days under the Green Revolution. 
fair enough certain things happened it all happened but uh, now we are in such a pathetic condition that instead of taking care of the soil and preparing uh, crops with uh, rich rich nutrients whether it's paddy or whether it's fruits vegetables people are reverting to owning the seeds by going into genetically modified seeds which would give you better uh, nutrients or adding nutrients after harvest so fortification is coming into practice the government of india has introduced a new scheme where fortified rice is being brought into the market has already been brought into the market now where what they do is they get the rice the rice is of low quality because you are using all hybrid seeds and seeds of uh, modern uh, uh, bulk production seeds which do not have enough nutrients plus the soil doesn't have enough nutrients to pump into the seeds into the crop so after harvest the rice is taken to factories where the rice is powdered and in this powdered rice they add uh, iron b6 and b12 reform it into the shape of grains again and for 1 kg of this 99 kg of normal rice is added and that's coming back into the pds system and into the midday meal schemes of children so what has happened is the fortified iron rice intake does you know like external iron as iron how far it will be absorbed still is it to be proved and moreover iron is also provided to children through salt along with uh, iodine plus some of the governments including my own uh, government of tamil nadu here uh, provides iron tablets to children so iron through rice iron through salt iron as tablet what would be the long uh, time consequences of these are yet to be monitored so there is a growing concern among ecologists and among some uh, doctors and physio physiologists as to how this can be managed and how this is really going to improve the health status of children because there have been reports from certain parts of the country where such excess iron has called uh, caused a sort of inconveniences in children from tribal areas because their thalassemia is uh, dominant and uh, they have reported adverse impact because of these sort of inputs which come from external sources so it is wise enough to take care of the soil it is wise enough to grow healthier plants than to manipulate plants and uh, also manipulate crops after a harvest in the name of fortification okay so going forward you expect that most of our let's say cultivation will only be fortified to take care of the, the prevailing conditions health health conditions uh, well, of our people well if we can wake up if there is general public awareness and if the governments can really think about improving their soils we need not be worrying about it what has happened is now for example in the government of tamil nadu has brought out a separate <clears throat> organic farming policy where non chemical inputs are also going to be encouraged so that we improve the organic matter content of the soil we improve the crop productivity we improve the uh, nutrient status of the crops which will be harvested from that but it will, it will take time you know like it's not immediate uh, resolutions so we have to think about certain crops like for example millets for example this is the year of the millets and all the governments are promoting millets including the union government of india so uh, millets can be a good alternative the problem what happens is whenever any nutrient department or department concerned with nutrition and development for children talks about crops it it so happens that uh, they always go through the nutrient status of the product and recommend it Uh, why don't we use this millet, that millet, and give it to children? They will be nutrient. But you should also remember that children also are very choosy based on palatability. So unless we prepare food based on these nutrient inputs and make it palatable for the children, children are not going to accept it. So it has to be a multi-dimensional approach where we make use of naturally growing crops, uh, which are very good. and make them palatable and likable for children so the children love to have it and then you try to also create awareness through big restaurants the five star restaurants etc where millets can have to be you know like if the government brings an order that every restaurant uh, in its uh, whatever you know like the lunch menus or uh, dinner menus or buffets uh, must have one or two components made from millets whether it is ragi or uh, jawar or bajra or uh, corn, uh, small corns we call it as tinai samai etc here in uh, south uh, in uh, tamil nadu if some product is made from the in a palatable way like a dessert 
right? Naturally, there will be a slow, slow liking towards it. And with awareness through various media, like what you are trying to do now, uh, people are getting aware of what they're going to eat. And uh, if there is a general awareness and a demand for such products, then it can come in. And my request to the governments, all the governments, uh, irrespective of my own government here, to all the governments, the union government, all the state governments is, if you want the farmer to shift production from a water intensive paddy crop to a millet crop, the farmer will never do it because paddy has a minimum support price to buy. So whatever paddy he may produce, the government machinery is ready to buy it at just some cost which the, uh, the farmer knows that if I sell this, I'm going to get my money. Unless that sort of a provision is made for minor millets as well. Where the governments announce that, yes, you grow the millets, I am here to buy it from you. Because there's a demand for millets, but who benefits is, as usual, the market plays a role. You are aware of market rules, which have. So what we call it is in quotes middlemen. So they, they make the money, but uh, the real money does not reach the farmer. So if such projects are developed by the union government and by the state governments, where directly the farmer is able to bring it to the market and uh, gets a benefit out of it, I'm sure that over a period of time. And with climate change, Mr. Ayer, which we must always remember, Dr. Ayer, is that the climate change is going to have a great impact on food crops, especially paddy, wheat, and corn. So if that's going to happen, then the only food crop which may not be directly affected by climate change, as we expect it to as an ecologist, is minor millets. And uh, I am somehow confident and optimistic that with the right direction, if the government of India and the state governments move towards supporting millet production, there will be a time when India will be providing food for the world. Well said, doctor. Well said. Very happy. Uh, talking of millet, do you think uh, Indian soil is compatible for producing millet? My, my question has to move towards what are the different types of soil in India? And how does one test can how do you bring an awareness to the farmer saying that no, you ship season to season, you ship from this millet or you ship from sugar cane to millet or from wheat to millet. Is there any scope in future so that our farmers are more market uh, sensitive? Farmer is not at all bothered about what you want. Farmer wants money for the crop he produces. So if you can put a restriction and say that you produce this, this, I am ready to buy it from you. The farmer is ready to do it. And with today's technology and knowledge and know-how, almost any type of soil can support some sort of a crop or other. I'm basically a soil biologist. Now, if I, if uh, you, Dr. Ayer, if you can, uh, if you are now sitting in your studio or in your office, the moment you step out onto the soil, that's one, type, one type of soil. You just walk about some 50 meters from there, the soil quality is different. So soil is a, a continuum which is uh, modifying itself in various aspects. And uh, anthropogenic in, in, you know, in, in interventions, like our own activities by discarding uh, materials which are not uh, uh, nature friendly into the soil components have actually altered soils. So if we can also change our lifestyles in the course of time and look at it at a holistic way, not just as to farmer, the problem happens in our country is uh, whatever happens, we finally blame the farmer. We are, first, has, uh, we have to blame ourselves. <laughs> and once we blame ourselves and say that, okay, we have made a bad choice of habits and uh, we have to change our habits for the betterment of uh, not just our own health, but also the health of the ecosystem. And uh, look at Earth as a uh, thing. That's where I always believe in uh, uh, Paul Coelho, who says that uh, nature, uh, you know, like uh, you and I don't have a soul. According to his concept, is uh, there's only one soul, and that is Earth has a soul, and we are all part of that soul. So if you can believe that concept of we are all part of that soul, and we are trying to build up our own Earth as a soul, then probably that we would be able to achieve. And uh, uh, soil systems, yes, soils are deteriorating. That's why 2015 was declared as the International Year of Soils. The basic difference here is uh, Westerners did not concern about the soils because here in India, you can never find a farmer walk with shoes inside the soil, inside his field. Even if he wears uh, footwear, he will never wear it inside the field. So because here we respect soil as Mother Earth. And uh, in case we are able to provide with enough inputs to the farmers, enough knowledge for the farmers, but not expecting the farmers, where 
my my humble suggestion to all the governments is that farmers should be stakeholders in policy decisions because they know better than us what i'm trying to talk today with confidence is unlearning what i learned in textbooks and learning from the farmers there is traditional wisdom traditional knowledge and uh, lots of information available with farmers so interacting with them and trying to find out what would be good enough for them to grow for us to buy and thereby mediate things in such a way that it's a win win situation then probably there will be no way of looking back. Brilliant. Uh, sir, talking of earth, that brings me to the next question, your earthworm book. And that, that has been well read and well translated into many international languages. languages. Do you want to yeah. tell us more about that book? No, more than the book, I would tell about the earthworm. Because, you know, like, uh, we all know that right from childhood, we have studied that the earthworm is a friend of the farmer. Now, why should it be the friend of the farmer? A friend of the farmer, because it plows the soil. It not only plows the soil, it produces from its body various components. Uh, every earthworm which lives in the soil, it produces uh, its own urine, its own fecal matter. Apart from that, it produces salomic fluid, which keeps it moist, and also mucus. All these four combine in every burrow which the earthworm makes. And when it burrows and makes this burrow, uh, these components, these become something like petri plates, culture plates for microorganisms to multiply. So it's something like this, you know, like when I go to a doctor and I say that, uh, doctor, uh, I feel uncomfortable. The doctor first feels my pulse. And if the pulse is normal, uh, the doctor says, you're okay, you're just tired, go relax. If there's something wrong with my pulse, then the doctor prescribes a medicine. In the same way, you dig a soil and if the earthworm comes and says, hello, that's the pulse of the soil. The soil is okay. So earthworm is the pulse of the soil. Healthier the pulse, healthier the soil. So we have to bring back the soil organisms back into the soil. There are several parameters which are acting against it. Now, when you asked about fertilizers, there's a saying in Tamil, that is, uh, whoever takes salt has to drink water. So the more salt you keep adding to the soil, the soil demands more water. The more water you keep adding to the soil, the soil changes its structure. When the structure changes, it becomes compact. Deeper and deeper tractors and plows have to be used, which have eliminated the soil or topsoil organisms. So it's all going into a chain where a whole holistic approach is required today as to how I can manage my soil. So the thrust area should be on soil management and soil proliferation, augmentation of soil, rather than talking about crop productivity. We make such mistakes. Yeah. So that is where uh, this happens. A simple example is, Elephant, for example, we talk about uh, human-animal conflict with reference to elephants. One elephant requires at least one square kilometer area per day so to walk around and take it. So, but they move as a herd. So they require so much area. We take away their area. They definitely come into our area. So unless we provide food for them, we cannot control them. The same component comes over here. Okay. Very nice. Very nice. I mean, the importance of earthworm is probably magnified in your book, I'm sure, because people do not understand all this. It's not just, just that book. I also brought out a book for children called as the Earthworms, Our Wiggly Friends, published by Eklavia. I also brought it in Tamil, Manpuru, on, uh, by uh, E.L. Vagai. Yeah. So there are several books which I have written for children to understand the concepts and also to farmers as Manmakkal Mahasul, understand the components of the soil. Uh, basically, the thing is, uh, somewhere we have missed out the link. We have uh, missed out the link of keeping our soil healthy. I understand. I understand. Uh, doctor, I'm going to slightly digress now. I also mm -hmm. noticed that you are into, you are presently a member, panel member of a educa state education policy. Yeah. I would like to know, what is your take on national education policy 2020 announced by government of India? Uh, it has its own limitations. Uh, it has some, uh, I, I would not call it as a complete document. It has uh, several limitations in the policy. So our government, uh, state government, uh, government of Tamil Nadu, is not in favor of the national education policy. And uh, we have, uh, uh, the government has appointed a 13 member committee under Justice Murgesan as uh, chairman of the committee, a retired uh, High Court judge of the Delhi High Court. And we are about uh, 12 members, of which I am also one of the members. Uh, we are drafting the state's education policy. 
because for us uh, things matter a lot our uh, main theme of the government uh, of tamil nadu is social justification and uh, based on what we find through all this uh, modern jargons of uh, uh, 4g reaching our uh, all the places uh, without any development of uh, internet or connectivity and our children being uh, you know like uh, sort of a separated from the main stream uh, rural children are not able to gain the same sort of education which a normal child gets my humble suggestion to any government is do not create a competition between a ferrari and a maruti 800 you improve your maruti 800s to the level of ferraris your educational institutions your uh, faculty your uh, infrastructure your accessibility to every child in this country and then you call it by any general name of competition there is nothing wrong in it but unless you try to provide that infrastructure that sort of a component to our children everywhere to run a competition between them is unhealthy and will provide one day a sort of a differences among the society's hierarchy so the best thing is to have our own state education policy which will cater to the needs of our own children our own teachers and uh, moreover uh, education comes under the concurrent list of the government a government of india constitution previously it was a state subject so uh, our request uh, would be that uh, it's either brought back as a state list or as a concurrent list the it is it's binding on the uh, union government to take state governments under consultation uh, and uh, you know like there are several variations which have been suggested these things can happen like ignu was already offering it you know like open universities can definitely do it but uh, in a college system it becomes a very limited fact i think i should not be discussing too much about this <laughs> on this I, I understand i understand yeah. I, i just want yeah. to limit uh, uh, but but, uh, but, uh, but uh, uh, you, you see uh, no what uh, the core issue is uh, what they suggest is it's a very free movement from one place to another for one institution to another at any point of time you can withdraw you can rejoin now all this can happen in correspondence education now supposing you are running a college doctor here and uh, a student from your college withdraws in the second year you give him a, a diploma and you send him and then he comes after 5 years and says i want to join the third year the syllabus might have changed the things might have changed everything would have changed and you may not have a seat available in your college at that point of time so this sort of lateral entries and exits look good on paper look good on paper but uh, generally uh, i have been uh, in teaching in college uh, and this is my 50th year of teaching and um, having been uh, vice principal who was also in charge of admissions i i, I know that uh, there are lots of limitations which uh, cannot be applied directly what is being prescribed under the nep 2020 okay uh, dr sultan you being a faculty member of a college how important is environmental studies to a college student and are we are our students aware how to take care of the environment or is it that we, we are just careless about the entire issue your last statement is very true we are careless about it we are careless and careless the the, the basic thing is uh, which i have brought to the notice of several uh, educationists now because i am not any more in the academic councils or anything you see what uh, the government plan or the ugc suggested was every child irrespective of the subject in the second year they must compulsorily read about environmental sciences a very good initiative uh, i am not against that but they completely ignored the syllabus the syllabus is absolute replica of what we prescribe for a science student a child who is not very much interested in science has taken humanities or commerce or some literature what is the point in trusting science to a child who is not interested in science in the form of environmental sciences what a child requires or needs to be told is a day to day environment which is the most polluted area which you find in your nearby area or in, near your household your own kitchen where your mother is working this is what i want them to understand the uh, the gases which come through in combustor uh, not complete combustion of the stoves what the parent is inhaling 
what you are discarding, the plus. So why not we start from your home ecosystem, home as an ecosystem, your street as an ecosystem, your school or college as an ecosystem. This is what the child wants to know, not uh, to describe to the child, uh, define ecology or what is the food chain, the transfer of energy from the source in plants to a series of organisms by repeated process of eating and being eaten is called a food chain and to replicate it and write it and get marks is not serve the purpose. I, I humbly request the concerned authorities, especially the UGC, to revise the entire environmental biology syllabus for this general paper, which should be so based on self uh, analysis. Uh, and then probably, yes, it can have Like, for example, even food, you know, like what food you eat, is it healthy for you? You are going and buying something, is it healthy for you? What is the difference between uh, uh, organic food and uh, chemical food? What are the type of chemicals that are being used? What are the pesticides being used? Are these pesticides healthy? You are going and buying a mango or a banana from a shop. Has it ripened naturally or has it ripened artificially? If it has been ripened artificially, what are the chemicals that have been used? What can that cost to you? How can you diagnose between a naturally ripened fruit and a non-ripened fruit? These are the things I want to be taught inside a classroom as a general classroom, not only for okay. students, also for homemakers, for parents, for everybody. Every one of us need to know what I'm eating, what I'm breathing, what I'm drinking. I should know what I'm doing. I, I, you nailed it. In fact, uh, even waste segregation is becoming such a challenge in India. Like yeah. you have a recyclable waste, you have a dry waste, you have wet waste. Trying yeah, to now, ask people to... Now we are going to get new such... challenges. Dr. Iyer, you are going to get new challenges. With all electric vehicles, what are we going to do with the batteries which are going to be uh, thrown out after being used? Yeah, at least in that case, uh, Doctor, we have some time for why we have 10 years time. They say 10 years can be used and then can be discarded as a e-waste. So oh, we have well, what are we to going to do with it? The, 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 this is what I am trying to tell Dr. Iyer. Any industry, any industry, the largest industry in the world is the kitchen at home. Right? Every household has a kitchen. So they also produce waste products. Some of the products can are recyclable, some are not recyclable. If this can go into our mind, every industry, the Pollution Control Board, the CPCB or the State Pollution Control Boards, they all have regulations. So any, any manufacturer, any uh, patent holder who gives you the technology on this is how your thing has to be produced, always has a byproduct, like what comes from the kitchen, has a byproduct. And those uh, technology usually recommends that this is how it has to be recycled or reused or discarded safely. Somehow we compromise while implementing it. The problem is when I go through the rules, regulations, etc. We have excellent rules, but implementation we are failing. That's, that's, why, we... that's why we need to use a stick probably in the future to ensure that it will comply. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do not know. Uh, we always like to have because any technology we must also remember is like a knife. It's a double-edged sword. You can either peel a potato with it or you can kill somebody with it. How judiciously we use it, how wisely we use it, is it, it's what is of concern. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sulkan, I was also going through your, uh, your big uh, achievement where you have also worked on hydrocarbon projects. Uh, we would like to know, our viewers would like to know, what is this hydrocarbon project and what is no, India's no. position vis-a-vis -vis developing countries? No, no, it, it's not a hydro, it, it, the title says so, but actually okay. we have the uh, Oil and Natural Gas Commission uh, okay. in, uh, in the Delta region of Tamil Nadu. And um, okay. there have been several complaints about uh, pollution levels over there. So I was uh, nominated as chairman of a uh, committee to investigate and submit the report. So the report is with uh, the government and the government has to take action. Okay, okay. It's, uh, it's about the pollution which is there or is it about the striking of it's oil? A, it's about the consequences of uh, the industry on the land holdings of farmers over there. Ah, okay, okay. That's nice. Uh, Doctor, one question which uh, struck me while talking to you, you are a well-read man and you are quite uh, wise and all. What would be your suggestion or your, you know, this one, your value point to a younger generation who are taking up? Because most of them are diverting from, uh, let's say, core science 
to something like uh, IT, something like AI, something like machine learning. What could happen to the core scientists like you and you and others? No, that's because the thrust area today is artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning and IoT. Yes. Uh, yes. In fact, uh, I was addressing a group of about 500 children in Bangalore some time back. And uh, then it was addressed by a person from the computers uh, from Intel, actually. And uh, he was mentioning about uh, AI and how all these modern cars have been generated, including the XUV700, uh, which has a highly modern uh, computerized uh, systems. So after everything, the children wanted to know a feedback from me as an ecologist, what do you feel? I said, nothing can replace HI, human intelligence. AI, yes, it's good enough in certain things, in some components. But uh, the problem today is many, many parents, they also call me up for counseling, for uh, putting their children for education. So they call me up, they ask me, well, what can be the what would be the job opportunity for my child after four years, five years? This is a very, very wrong concept that has developed in the minds of many adults today. They, they, they are trying to predict what the child would be employable after five years. Maybe that industry itself may not exist. You know, like uh, what I have been trying to tell children is study whatever you are passionate for. Study whatever you are passionate for. You can always grow into it. I, I loved zoology, so I studied zoology. So you know, like it's it's basically uh, what subjects you like, you do it well, and if you're passionate with what you study, definitely you shine in some way or other. Uh, I want my only message to my youngsters is don't predict how rich you will be. Just predict how happy you will be. It is happiness that's going to make your life adorable, enjoyable. And uh, you uh, maybe at, at the at my age, like senior citizens, you will feel happy that you had taken a wise decision because uh, just thinking that this alone will get a job. Somehow many people have not been happy with it. Somehow disillusioned. I know many people from the computer industry now doing farming and they feel that they are connected to nature now and lots of problems also occur with it, which uh, I don't think this would be a suitable platform to tell because these children, they work late night hours in India because they are connected to the Western world and uh, continuous exposure to lights has a basic uh, sort of a interference with their chronobiological rhythms and uh, many hormonal fluctuations leading to several health factors. You know, like uh, we just get happy. We think that our children are working in I, uh, IT sector, working the whole night, but they're getting exposed to. Once in a way is okay, but a continuous exposure. One person travels from US to India, say complains of jet lag and relaxes for three, four days. Whereas our children are sitting day in and day out overnight inside the uh, rooms. So when you look at such parameters, a parent should always look at a holistic approach for their child, at the happiness of the child and the happiness of the family. This is my only advice to the next generation. Yeah, that's very nice. That's nice. But the main concern, uh, doctor, is the present generation, they're all waning away from the, you know, the soil science, as we are discussed earlier. Basic I mean, sciences. The, no one is willing to smell the soil. No one is willing to see the earth in the soil. They all are moving <laughs> to white collar jobs. Sir, when, Dr. Iyer, when we were small kids, you know, like when it rained, our grandparents said, Jao, mitti mi khelo, go, play, Bilko, play Bilko the soil, Bilko, yeah. right. smell the soil. Right. And we still remember that uh, I had a cousin of mine who would take that fresh smell sand and put in the mouth and eat it also <laughs> because of the petrichor taste of it. Uh, and uh, today, uh, parents say, don't put your hands in the soil, you'll get infected. And then they pay extra money under uh, kindergarten schools for the child to play in the sand bath. <laughs> concepts have changed. We can't help it. Can't help it. Good, good. Are you still uh, guiding uh, PhD students? Or? Uh, I, no, I sometimes advise them. I can't guide them because I'm now 72. And uh, universities in India, unfortunately, private universities do encourage, but I'm not interested because I don't want my knowledge to be commercialized. So um, uh, government universities, I have produced 20 PhDs so far, of which uh, 16 are from Madras University, one from Mahatma Gandhi University, Kerala, and uh, three from uh, University of Science, Malaysia. So, you know, like it has been fun. And uh, much of the knowledge which is found in my books is a contribution from all my students. 
uh, extremely wonderful set of students have worked with me because I selected students not based on marks but based on their interest, based on whether they would be prepared to put their hands into soil and dung and work with it at the grassroots level. I never wanted a student with a brilliant mark to come to me. I know, I know. That's a, I mean, a sign of a good teacher. I understand. <laughs> Every child is brilliant. Every child is brilliant. I never uh, judge a child based on marks. I, I think uh, I only wish that all teachers uh, select the students rather than going with just like a mark sheet. Because marks yeah. are something which is uh, deceptive. They don't really come out. They, the do, not, they do not reflect the true, true uh, sort of a passion of the child. I know, I know. Brilliant talking to you, Dr. Sulkan Ahmed Ismail. Very nice, very insightful. You. And uh, you, do you have any last few words for New York Times Hub before we wind My up? My only humble request to all the youngsters who are watching this program is try to connect with nature, whatever you can do, in whichever way you can do. It is not necessary that you should uh, work under pollu uh, after pollution or this and that. Even in a small way, whatever you can do for nature. And Please keep studying, gain knowledge. Degrees are secondary. Knowledge is important. Knowledge is going to be very important. What you are gaining today through Google is information. I, I, I want you to gain knowledge, not just information. There's a slight difference between these two. So aim towards a wonderful knowledge. Prove yourself and be an asset to this beautiful country so that we can lead the next century, our country, as one of the best countries in the world, because I am optimistic that one day we will be providing food for the world. Brilliant, Doctor. Very nice. Thank you so much for joining your side. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure having a chat with you. Thank you so much. I appreciate your Thank time. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you very much.